Hi, friends. I've got a few shows coming up in September that I would love to see you at. On September 5th through the 7th, I'll be at the Timpanogos Storytelling Festival in Lehigh, Utah. On September 13th, I'll be at the Little Snake River Museum in Savory, Wyoming. And on September 14th, I'll be at Swallow Hill Music in Denver, Colorado. There's more information and links for tickets on my website, andyhedges.com. If you're enjoying the show and would like to help me keep it going, you can make a donation to the podcast, and you can also do that on my website. Once again, that's andyhedges.com. I'd like to start today's show with a poem written by today's guest. This is from Sean Sexton's new book, which is entitled May Darkness Restore. And this piece is entitled The Prosperous Year. Today with the cattle grows the cash, consigning debt to an easier portion, resting minds, filling pockets, greening grass like morning rain fresh off the ocean. A warm, wet winter kept the bulls active, and shortly spring took over the land. A tired old world made on sixty-cent calves has resurrected into something grand. Prosperity ruins us to a man, lucre for the prudent and mistaken. All I can say is get it while you can, and pray once asleep hardship won't waken. As mammon joins our most common vices, the cure for high prices is high prices. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working cowboy west and beyond. My guest today is Sean Sexton. Sean is a poet, an artist, and a rancher. I sat down with Sean in his home on his family ranch in Vero Beach, Florida, and recorded this interview. Here's Sean Sexton. Well, I'm uh, a third-generation Florida rancher, and uh, my son will will be the fourth. My grandfather started this ranch, and it's uh, now 76 years old. And we've been here, um, I've been in this same place my whole life, really, except for a stint at college. When I was uh, four years old, well, really, when I was five, I started going to work with my dad. He was, he set about to, he'd gotten a animal husbandry degree at uh, Florida for, for beef cattle. Came home, and he was very progressive. He was doing things over and above what my grandfather uh, envisioned for the ranch. And my grandfather was very progressive. He he put in a set of scales in 1953 as an example. My my dad started. We we're, we're on the we're charter members of the uh, Florida Beef Cattle Improvement Association. We started performance testing our herd in the early 50s. Computerized all of the all of the data and the the values, the production values, and. Uh, we continue to this day. I've got a cattle max program there on that little computer on the table and uh, spend hours uh, recording, you know, the uh, information out of the calf book that we uh, collect at, on, during calving season when, when, some, when a calf is born and uh, tie it to the dam's number. And, uh, and then when we weigh and grade, we assign all of the you know the 205 day weight and the weaning values of the uh of the the calf weight to the cow and all that sort of thing so when i started going up the road with him when i was five 
to manage a grass fattening operation two miles away, kind of uh, ahead of its time. I just uh, I don't remember ever doing anything but that, being uh, accompanying my father and messing with cows, you know, taking care of cows. He uh, he split his uh, paycheck. He had to get a job off off the ranch to help pay for the ranch. He was buying the ranch from his from his father. He was doing that probably after that was even possible to do, and uh, so he he really did not do well. You know, he had uh, had to get loans, and um, he he was a, a perfect rancher. He turned everything into debt. And he had a black man uh, whose job I have now. I, I used to say I was a sole employee of the ranch, and uh, we have about 350 cows and 70 replacements, and we're on uh, a little over a section of land. And uh, I was telling Bill Lohman this, and he said, well, I got, I got uh, 400 cows, and I have 36 sections <laughs> in North Dakota, so uh, the Western and Florida standards are, uh, are quite vary quite a lot. You know, this is like a chicken coop. <laughs> anyway, my dad was so poor at that time when he was running up the road and managing that place for a very wealthy man that he had to he had to share a spare, a, a, a pair of spurs with the with Eddie uh, uh, the the sole employee, they, he wore one side and Eddie wore the other. And they, they literally could only afford one pair of spurs. <laughs> so it's, it's what I've always done. I, I, I wasn't sure, you know, because I've always been interested in art and writing. I wasn't sure that I was going to come home from school. I, I also got a, a, a beef cattle science degree. I've I've always you know the people I hung out with most at at college in Gainesville at, at University of Florida were were artists, but um, I've always had a hand in the uh, I've always you know known that um, I was going to be here, even if I was going to be a writer or an artist, and uh, the the draw was strong. And then you get a little older and you start looking at things and you realize I'm not going to have a better deal than I'm going to have right here. You know, the the world doesn't offer you uh, tracts of land as places to be. You know, I've spent enough time uh, at school paying rent to people that I knew I didn't want to I didn't want to be that that person in a city doing that. Home looked even better than uh, it did in the beginning when I didn't really know anything. And my son is now here, and he is, uh, I, I say he's my boss now. It's very apparent to him. At, at the start, I don't think he was really, he, he thought, I'm not going to do that, you know, that kind of thing. And now he would not do anything else. He loves it. It's so funny. I would go into my dad's office on Friday, and he'd, He'd sit down and write out my paycheck. Now I go into my dad's office on Friday and my son writes, writes out my paycheck. And I think, I didn't get that part, you know, of writing out the paycheck. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I missed it, to tell you the truth. The uh, composer Felix Mendelssohn said, the first part of my life I was my father's son. And the second part of my life I was my son's father. And it's just exactly uh, how it is. And my dad and I were best friends, you know. We, he took me out of school to go to the Florida Beef Cattle Short Course, to, which is a, a three-day seminar every year in Gainesville. That, let's see, this is probably the 60-something, 65th one coming up now. It's been going on a long time. The University of Florida is a land-grant college, so it's the, it is the agricultural school and this state. We're right at the edge of the tropics in the Caribbean and South America and Central America and the research that is done here really only applies to a subtropical production environment and so um, 
all those people at the range cattle stations and the the uh, main university campus and really they're set all around the state there are not as many as there were all of the uh, agricultural colleges have have downsized and shrunk i bet a and m probably has as well but anyway uh, we have a real a real kind of almost family relationship with with our professors i had some of the same ones he had it, not enough time had passed that they hadn't retired yet. It's a small community, the Florida's ranching community. And I've been involved in that my whole life, really. And now my son, uh, back to back to the topic, we share those things in the same at the same moment we're sharing in our our life, our lives together. It's really uh, I mean, who gets to go to work with their son every day, you know? We we load up in that uh, John Deere Gator, and we go out and move the cows. And I see him uh, almost my entire day, and vice versa. And um, I just feel so fortunate. I know a lot of people who don't get to do that. In fact, their children are halfway across the United States. Yeah, I tell you, when my son... Uh, when you're going to find this out, Andy, when your kids get to be about uh, 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 maybe even as early as 13, 14, 15, I think there's an impulse. Uh, Robert Bly said every son has to kill his father, you know. And uh, I, I said that to Wendell Berry one time, and he said, that's not true. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't think that was correct. But... Um, I think there is a, a a grain of truth in that. They're, they've got to grow up and become their own man, you know. And you you just got to go through that with with your son. <laughs> He's gonna or your son. So you have two, right? And they're gonna at some point they're gonna be defiant. They're not gonna want to spend any time with you. I tell you, it's it's hard, and um, they, they even need uh, you know disciplining. I mean, your your children are very well behaved, but. Even so, and and mine was too. They, uh, it's all that stuff about being becoming a man. You know, it happens, and then one day it's over, and and they want you. They want you back. And having been rejected, you know, at that earlier phase, he's the person in the world I want to spend time with the, the most. Honestly, if he wants me to do something, by gosh, I get up and I go do it. Uh, I, I help him do things all the time. My dad really didn't. I'd say that about him. He had he put me in charge here, and it was kind of a sink or swim thing, you know. But um, when when Mike wants me to help him do something, I I you know I'm 64 years old. The horizon's right here now. It's not way out there, and. Uh, I'm just not going to pass up too many opportunities to do that. We also cover for one another. When I go out to Elko, uh, um, he's he doesn't say, "Well, how long are you going to be gone?" You know, and all that. It's it's just what it is. And he loves to hunt, so when he goes to South Carolina to his deer hunting lease, um, I don't say, "Now you be back by Monday." You know, he knows that he knows what's what, and uh, if if he can't get back by Monday, it, you know, he he, uh, he understands that um, I've got him covered till he does. So we help each other in that way. It's a good thing. My friend and poet Vess Quinlan wrote a poem about working with his son entitled Passing the Mantle. How small he was, and how he struggled with the work. He irrigated, fed, doctored, and learned as I had the difference between right and close, then sought my approval to validate his knowing. How strange it seems, and how right, that a simple passage of time has brought us here where I finish this day of favorite work and look to my son 
for his approval. This thing back to the relationship with your father, uh, what would you say is the greatest lesson you learned from your father? I think his um, persistence, he, he was dogged, you know, uh, in his approach to things. One time re- regarding that, um, that steer fattening operation, uh, my dad told Wilburn Martin, an old cowboy, uh, well, he had him come and help him brand all those steers that they just, they just bought a hundred head of steers. Wilburn said, uh, when they got done, well, my dad, my dad said, uh, okay, Wilburn, uh, we're going to get them up every two weeks and weigh them. And, uh, apparently they were pretty wild when they were putting that, those brands on them, they numbered them. And Wilburn said, Ralph, you're going to be old and gray headed before those cattle are ever in the pens again. <laughs> and, uh, my dad told me that story and I said, well, did you weigh them? And he said, you bet I did. He said, I weighed him just like I said I was going to. So he taught me that. I guess you could say the fastest way to work cows is slow. And he was a mule, you know. He was he was somebody that just did not stop. He didn't quit. He wasn't uh, ostentatious or flashy, but uh, he was somebody who... Uh, was in pace with the with the earth and he abided in in that in a certain way he he, we never talked about it but just observing in retrospect i can say that he really did he he was connected it's really wonderful attribute he was very kind and his father was harsh and unsettled he had a hard time with him and the best thing I can say about him is that he did not he did not pass that on. That's something that usually happens. You know, somebody has a, a bad deal, and they're all too eager to bring bring it to somebody else. He was not that way. He completely absorbed that and uh, kept that to himself. And he was the kindest, really most wonderful man that I I've ever that I've spent my life with. I've written a lot about him. I've got a, a wonderful poem uh in my new book that uh is just a, it's about him. It's called Day's Work. The uh this is uh it's a they set up for Vero Airport over our place, so you know there's gonna be an occasional airplane, but that's <laughs> That's a legitimate ambient noise. <laughs> it's most of the time pretty quiet here. Day's work. After he was brought into his room, we split a cowboy shirt down the back, eased his bruised arms through the sleeves, and he assumed the appearance of a sleepy rancher taking his noonday nap. He went to death as to a day's work, got his shoulder into it, as when he was 13, working at the dairy, milking a man's worth of cows before school. He said no to the feeding tubes in quiet disappointment, having failed the second swallowing test in the hospital. Without the news secreted among us, he'd been disabled by a stroke and any idea of which direction to head. He closed his eyes, last words already spoken. A mineral patience entered his face. Same as the afternoon he sat his horse, tied to the caught heifer, hung up with a deformed calf I had to puzzle out of her in the hour and a half it took. And there he stayed, his pain subsumed as a forest into mist. Through five days' struggle, crossing oceans of breath, He journeyed between realms, the occult mastery of heart and human tide at work in slow surcease, the weight, the pain, and distance, all he traversed to overcome himself as we kept vigil until he found the narrow, difficult way out. 
So you see the, it's kind of uh, about that we did everything together in, in that sense, you know, we had trouble, we had to face it together. In writing about Sean Sexton's book, Blood Riding, poet Drum Hadley said this, Its stories are born of a four-generation family cattle ranch and the king of the southern cattle states, Old Florida. Everybody says one, one erroneous thing or another about Florida always. The, the first thing you'll hear is, I didn't know there were any cattle in Florida. And the second one is... Um, you're the biggest state. You have the most cows, you know, and both of those things are not true. We, uh, we are uh, definitely a reckoning force in the uh, national cattle picture. The beef industry is a segmented industry, and we comprise almost completely the cow-calf segment. This is where calves come from. And uh, I heard Paul Engel of Hitch Feeders in uh, uh, Texas, big Texas feeder there. I uh, can't remember where, what, Hereford, Texas. At our national, I'm sorry, our annual convention in Marco Island, a cattle, a Florida Cattlemen's Convention, he said, if you want to line up uh, loads of calves, there are more 500 head lots of them within a 100-mile radius of Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee, than anywhere else in the U.S. And when we need to, to get calves quick, we come to Florida. The, the state has, in other words, a lot of large ownership of, of cattle and land. And at all of that said, the state is in a certain amount of transition and has been my whole life really the starting transition was into citrus into the citrus industry cattle acres were being lost to citrus but uh we we are losing our citrus industry it is it is dying there's a pathogen in the landscape that we can't do anything about at the moment anyway called citrus greening the uh other force is urbanization and there are a thousand people moving into the state of Florida every day. Even if they're moving to urban centers or suburban places, uh, those suburban places grow into rural areas and take uh, agricultural acres away. The landowner uh, sometimes doesn't have a choice about selling land or is selling by preference or uh, is selling to great advantage and uh, there's there's a real sort of degradation of um, of the of the landscape the working landscape because of those those two different forces the uh, typical cowboy I, I know now uh, cattleman is on lease land he's a leasehold cattleman all of the big landowners have been there a long time and even they uh, in some degree might be selling edges of their property that are that touch uh, urban areas or suburban areas the ones who are really serious about being in a cow business and successful are they're growing they might be buying land outside of the state they uh, they try to make their their uh, operations larger a lot of Florida, large Florida cattle ranches are now uh, backgrounding cattle in other states like Mississippi or Alabama. Some of them are even feeding cattle. But the industry is trying hard to stay in Florida. We have a program called the Rural and Family Lands Protection Act. It was passed in 1991. It was uh, an initiative in the uh, Florida Senate and it laid out the language and the, the strictures by which conservation easements could be overlaid upon family lands and the development rights sold. In so doing, uh, some sort of entity purchases the development rights 
and they're extinguished. That leads to an opportunity for the landowner to capitalize on part of his land, the the uh, part of the right to develop, without selling his land. He still has the farm value. But if he ever wanted to sell it, he could only sell it for the value that it has as a, as a farm, you know, as a, a production place. And we did that in 2007. We were the first agricultural uh, conservation easement enacted in the state of Florida on our land. We put our whole ranch into that. And we are um, bound by a document to um, uh, farm into perpetuity or to, to ranch into perpetuity. That's the deal. And it was a lengthy process, and it happened just before the boom. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, just before the boom went bust in 08. Really, it was the first time we were ever out of debt. It straightened out an awful lot of things about our lives, being able to do that. Uh, and, 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 and guess what? We didn't have to sell out to do that, you know? We have our land, and uh, we have things that we have to abide in, but um, they, they really don't conflict with being in the cow business. We couldn't have a dairy and we couldn't have a poultry farm. We we agreed to that. And uh, when when they uh, take anything like that out of the picture, uh, that has to go into the appraisal of the the development rights, and that's an add-on, and they pay for that much more. You know, when they when they value it, both we we sold the uh, the v- development rights to Indian River County. But there should be a state program uh, helping with that funding. And we have the program in place, but we don't have the political will. The, the re- legislators are not, they're not voting to make funding sources for this to happen. And there are, there are probably uh, 75 or 80 ranches waiting for the program to, to come through with funding so they can sell their development rights. That will really help a lot with halting that kind of degradation of of green space. I've been the uh, state director of the uh, Indian River County Cattlemen's, that's our home county association now for about 30 years. And uh, here's an unusual thing. I'm the chairman and have been for about 35 years of the uh, Sebastian River Improvement District. It used to be called the Sebastian Water Control District. And uh, the problem in Florida is getting rid of water. It's, <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah, you you notice you drove along a big wide ditch on your way here. Whichever way you came, you did that. And if you look out across the way, you'll see those hedgerows. And that's a sublateral right out there of the uh of the Sebastian Water Control District. And I'm one of the supervisors and I I'm an elected official in a quasi-public institution and have to fill out a disclosure form every year. We, our job is to maintain those canals so that we always have drainage. We have annual meetings and also we meet quarterly, talk about the spending the money of a, it's a 10,000 acre reclamation project enacted by the state of Florida in 1927 by the legislature. And there, those districts are all over Florida, so we've had to had to uh, know about that. It's it's very similar to New Mexico. Those little hand dug water networks, uh, they're called Asiecas. The Milagro Beanfield War was about that. There was a little war over water out in New Mexico, and those are all hand dug. We we actually use track hose and drag lines on ours. We have a bigger bigger canals because we have more water. But I'm involved in that. I'm, a, I'm actually an elected official. Sometimes I say uh, or think education is wasted on youth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the high school uh, English stuff was not at, at the time I, I disliked high school so much I even made uh, sometimes uh, 
made arrangements to be gone. <laughs> One of the first poems we ever studied in, in high school was The Raven. And all of those wonderful sort of antique cadences of The Raven. When I first heard Grass, or Anthem, I, I wondered if, if he hadn't based it on The Raven. Because uh, there's some similarities but it's it's still not quite that form. And then I found out that he, that Buck Ramsey had g- gotten it from from Pushkin, from Eugene Onegin. But anyway, uh, my aunt and my mother were. My aunt was a was a writer. She was a New York Times best-selling uh, author of a book about her her son who battled leukemia. It was a book called Eric. She she wrote it about his. His struggle that was back in uh, the seventies, early seventies. So she made a living at at a desk writing, and my mother uh, she had a a traumatic incident in her life that sort of stopped her from maybe even doing the same thing. She was every bit as gifted as as my aunt, and th- their father was a writer and a humorist and a classic cartoonist. So I'm kind of bred on the writing side, you know, on the, on the dam side. And uh, there's a lot of creativity on the other side, too. I'm sort of double bred. They, they were always passing poems under my nose. And uh, when I started school, um, this sort of revolutionary uh, first quarter at the community college in Gainesville, where I started attending sc- uh, college, it was uh, interdisciplinary studies, and they put all the 100-level college entry courses together. And we were taught in an amphitheater by six professors, all of the disciplines all at one time, with them telling us how they interrelated. We would then break out and go do the math part or do the English part. The English teacher that I met there was someone who just absolutely was in love with literature and she infected me with that and that was her I mean she was a a great English teacher too but her her feeling about writing uh, she loved writing as much as Joel Nelson loves writing you know (laughs) which I just found out having him here for for a couple of days she also had us keep uh, a journal for, as a course assignment, and that was, we were not only becoming uh, educated, but we were becoming socialized in a certain way with this group. We were There were 80 of us, and we were all taking this together, and she wanted us to write in our journals daily, and that was in 1973, and I've never stopped. I was writing poetry in, in those journals. As I was reading poetry in that course, things were coming to me, you know, and in a way, I sort of don't remember not not writing poetry now. It was partly her fault that I, I I'd been exposed to it throughout every like everybody in high school, you know, high school literature. They usually make you read some sort of terrible part of Chaucer or something like that, and and you wonder, uh, my God, you know, or or a, Dickens is completely lost on a teenager, you know, he's just not gonna. He's not going to come to it with any kind of appreciation that might happen later. Now, I can't get enough of... I've got a, My weakness is books. I'll, I'll take you in my library and you'll see. It's crazy. I come home from uh, Elko with more books. <laughs> <laughs> what does your writing process look like at, at this point in your life? Out the, the the wonderful the great poet Alice Fryman told me uh, I, I attended a workshop with her uh, that she was giving we I'm a member of a literary foundation and I she was doing an adult writers workshop and uh, I was sort of monitoring the class she said I I would kill for a rough draft you know I realized that that's what that is you know when when something comes to you. Um, and you can just uh, get it down in one of these books. And so the first thing is apprehending an idea and a rough draft. The other day, Mike was, 
he was off somewhere and uh, I was letting all the cows on the pasture and I left the field and I was able to go slowly because he's always in a hurry you know when we're when we're moving the cows letting them on and it was a beautiful bright morning and there were all these different things going on that were just I was like an antenna you know it was really coming to me channeling the meadow larks you know it just seemed like I was having one of those Walt Whitman moments they were they were on their grassy podium singing a thousand year old song that that is you know one of the things that came to me I realized god it was just like magic you know the light and the dew and the conditions why is that anything new to me I've been out there my whole life you know thousands of days but it had it was just happening I left that field with four rough drafts that morning just going across the ranch opening gates for cows shutting them when they all went through moving on everything seemed like a literary possibility to me with some sort of fragment of meaning it's a subject subject rich environment out there anyway I've got what so many writers don't have. I mean, this real terrific stuff, it's there, you know, and, and, I, and I also know about it, which is another wonderful thing. I'd love to be able to write the whole rest of my life without having to do any research. Wouldn't that be cool just to, to write straight out of what's already there, out of a kind of knowingness? It's really not going to happen, though. I mean, it's important if... If you want to say something a certain way, you really need to uh, to do research too. But that's and then the editing is another process. And that little computer, you know, uh, I edit out of here, out of one of these uh, poems, one of these rough drafts. I edit onto uh, like that. There's a there's a whole poem right there from that day called. Uh, Firing the hay spot. We have this these places where we put out some hay. I just got this idea, you know, we can ill afford to set any kind of fire right now. We're in a drought, but the grass isn't going to go through, grow through it. It became the whole context for a poem. Uh, two mornings ago, I, I edited it into into a word uh, new blank document. I just started whipping it into, I was thinking, should it be a four-line stanza or should it be tercets? Should it be six of those? And uh, could there be a rhyme scheme or could there even be a, a soft rhyme where you don't sound the full chime, you know, where you just have the same kind of ending, like a, a gerund, you know, uh, an I-N-G ending on two of the lines and the other two have a, a different have maybe a past tense kind of ending or the the art of form and uh content so it's like that you know i'm i'm so interested in so many kinds of poetry and uh my my growing up in poetry has been the process of taking on form and not just having it all be free verse and content you know i really love the constraint of form I like that and when I say form I mean rhyme and meter and sometimes even a whole uh, like a a sestina or a villanelle you know that kind of thing you I'm sure you encounter form and in, in things you read I mean my god every, what you were doing yesterday had a lot of metrical kind of consonants and uh, structure a song just naturally brings something into a kind of form. It's interesting to me, the constraint of form is actually liberating, I think. In writing about poetry and form, Christian writer and pastor John Piper said this, Emotions are like a river flowing out of one's heart. Form is like the river banks. Without them, the river runs shallow and dissipates on the plain. But banks make the river run deep. Why else have humans for centuries reached for poetry 
when we have deep affections to express. Why don't I read you the title poem of that book? It's a villanelle. It's, um, it's kind of a love poem. <laughs> kind of a mortality poem. I hate, I hate making you think that this whole book's about mortality and, and all that, you know. Maybe I should do a short, a short one before I do the long one. And it's something that it's an interesting story too because I was uh, I was coming home from Elko when I was in the the uh, airport in Salt Lake City. I was thinking about a lot of things. I was thinking about the fact that everybody was eating stuff, you know. And I thought, how many of these people are responsible for making food happen in this world, you know, for growing it? Because man, you go to an airport and everybody's eating. I thought, I'm probably, there's, I, I could yell out and, you know, all farmers, lift, raise your hands, or all uh, ranchers or food producers, and I bet you, uh, you know, there'd be somebody way down over there, you know, raising their hand, but nobody else would. And that's what it is, you know, uh, we're, we're doing this on behalf of about 90, 98 point five percent of the the population and then uh, I also was looking at people and thinking I saw a girl and she had this kind of stern look on her face and she had this brow that almost seemed like it would make more sense for that brow to be on a on a man you know or or I thought I was trying to guess how she might actually look look more like her father than her, than her mother but in a pretty way you know kind of a beautiful way and you know in the cow business you're always you're always looking at uh, calves and mammy in them you know figuring out who they go with and looking at the bull and how his traits are descending looking at the daughters out of a bull you know all that stuff that's like the cow business, you know. If you're not interested in that, you ought not to be in the cow business. This is called descent. She has her father's hands small and delicate on him, and the ears of the old man made in pearly skin. His features, fair and slight, best imagined on another, have crossed a great divide reaching from his mother. We walk around our lives a panoply of parts, all with the he and she of it tangled in our hearts. And this is the, uh, the villanelle and the title of the book, May, May Darkness Restore. A villanelle has uh, repeating sections. Yeah, there's a couple of lines and, and ideas that kind of hold constant, you know, through the poem. I think there are nine lines that are already set once you have two of them figured. May darkness restore our youth to these hands. Life has kept our love in arrears. Time will take us to faraway lands. Your love has made me a changed man. You've fed my hunger, allayed my fears. May darkness restore my youth to your hands. I feel your skin, your sweet demands. Open your arms, draw me near. Time will take us to unforeseen lands. As beauty is lost, as troubles expand, the night will help us find each other and darkness restore youth to our hands. I know your secrets, I know your plans. Beyond our dreams, beyond these years, Time will take us to faraway lands to hold you now and understand, to grasp your feet, to smell your hair. May darkness restore our youth to these hands and light our way through terrible lands.
folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Sean Sexton for taking the time to visit with me. You can find out more about Sean at seanssextonfineart.com. You can find out more about me and this show at andyhedges.com. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. <laughs>